closing time, the close of an era. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. As the depression deepened, competition for scarce jobs grew fierce. In laundries, factories, construction companies, Mexican workers were replaced by U.S. citizens. Devastating is a good adjective to use for Mexicans in Los Angeles and the Depression. Very quickly, by 1931, you know, half the population is unemployed, much larger than the general Los Angeles population. That means a lot of the people that had had fairly secure employment before this period now are out of work. My father lost a job. He didn't want to receive relief. He didn't want to receive it. He wanted to work. But like I said, there was no work for Mexicans. At least my mother was working as a maid in a wealthy family. President Hoover, by 1931, is desperate to stay in office. He is roundly blamed for the Depression. And he begins to look for scapegoats. And it's his Secretary of Labor who begins to say, well, you know, if we simply got rid of Mexicans, we would have jobs for everyone else. Los Angeles begins to target the Mexican community. The first ever immigration raid is done at the plaza. Immigration authorities are brought in from other places to kind of surround the plaza. They end up capturing as many Japanese or Chinese Americans at the plaza and they do Mexicans. Um, and they deport 15 people that day. But what they wanted to do is scare people, and they accomplished that. In the weeks following that immigration raid, people were scared to go to work. They were scared to, to go outside. This created a great panic, not only among the Mexican community, but also among their employers. In Los Angeles, the Mexican consul suggested that instead of persecuting Mexicans, the city buy train tickets for anyone willing to return to Mexico now peaceful a decade after the end of the revolution. Initially, in 1931, when they start this, they have no problem filling the trains. There are plenty of people who are unemployed, who want to go back. By 32, they have trouble filling the trains, and that's when more coercive measures start to be used. County welfare officials begin to target certain neighborhoods neighborhoods that they know have a large number of unemployed Mexicans. They will go house to house. They will say, the cheese that you're getting, the bread we've been giving you, is no longer going to be made available to you. Instead, we will give you this one ticket, and this is for a ride back to Mexico on a train. This is your only choice. You will get no more assistance. For the Castañedas, the knock on the door came early in 1935, not long after tragedy struck the family. My mother got sick with TB, and she died. She died in 1934, the 10th of May. I was making my first communion that day when my, when my mother died. I remember when they buried her. I remember that they had to drag me out of there because I was so emotional what was happening to her, what was happening to us. Natividad Castaneda was offered three tickets for himself and his two American-born children on a train going to Durango in northern Mexico. We had a trunk, a big trunk, and the first thing that he put in there was his working tools. That's what went in there, and a couple of blankets that we had, a few cooking utensils and dishes, and what little clothing we had. Because we lost everything. We arrived at the train station that was very crowded. People crying, children and adults. I was approached by a man. He says that I could stay here that I would become a ward of the state. You know, like you hear about these orphanages, 
I, I didn't want to be in an orphanage. I wanted to be with my father and my brother. I had a family. Between three and 500,000 Mexicans and Mexican Americans are forced out of the United States in the 1930s. There are plenty of Americans who said, we don't want the European immigrants anymore. There are plenty of Americans who said, we don't want any Italians, we don't want any Poles, we don't want any Jews. But there was never an action to round them up en masse uh, and to send them back to their home countries. And this is what happened to Mexicans. We went to live with this tia, my father's aunt. We really weren't welcome because, you know, there wasn't much room even for them. So we had to live outdoors, sleep outdoors. Pouring rain. There was no place for us to go but put up with the rain. There was no running water. We had to go miles to go wash clothes. My dad used to go to work. He taught my brother the trade. And I told him that I was leaving school, that I, I would be with him. I didn't have time to be playing here and there. I had to work. Clearly, it sets up a pattern of wanting Mexican labor at times in which employment is needed and wanting people to just leave and go somewhere else when that labor is no longer needed. To be marked as visibly Mexican in America in the 1930s is to put you and your family at risk. And so Mexicans become, in L.A. in the 1930s, what one historian has called the invisible minority. In other words, they withdraw from public life. It doesn't mean that their culture disappears, but it means that a community that had been so expansive and overflowing retreats into a kind of shell. <laughs> 